Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining our live Q and A session. My name is Liv Gruber and I help out with the design and marketing at Winona, but today I'm going to be your moderator. Today, our chief medical officer, Dr. Michael Green is going to be answering all of your questions. So go ahead and drop your questions in the chat. Um, I don't know what it looks like for you guys, but it's on my right hand side. There should be a chat box. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have Dr. Green give an introduction, and then he'll start answering all of your questions. So hi, uh, my name is Mike Green. Um, many of you um, have seen my face on Winona or um, are my patients, um, and so you get to sort of see me in person. Um, I'm an OBGYN. Uh, I finished residency in 99, so I've been doing this for about 23 years, um, so quite a while. I currently, my day job, um, I work as an OB hospitalist um, in Northridge, California, but I had a, a full-scale OBGYN practice for about 17 years. Um, I also see patients in Lake Arrowhead, um, but sort of my real passion right now is Winona um, and um, taking care of uh, menopause symptoms and, and perimenopause symptoms and helping you all um, get through this difficult transition um, and really keep you feeling young and healthy um, and, you know, making your life full um, at this point, and that's really important. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of fear out there, um, not just for patients, but also in the medical community uh, about hormone replacement therapy, which is really unfounded. And it has to do with some old data that sort of got misinterpreted. Um, the press got to it sort of before like normal, the normal process and headlines were a little crazy and it got everybody scared to death. And we really, even though that was a long time ago, we still haven't recovered from that. But there's tons of data out there that hormone replacement therapy is safe for the pay, for, you know, appropriately screened patients. Um, and so we're really careful with that process with Monona to screen patients appropriately to make sure that we're getting you something that is very safe, number one, um, but also effective. Uh, and so that's, you know, really important. Uh, there was a, I usually start these off with sort of a little monologue, gives you a chance to get some questions in. And so one of the, what I want to talk about today was weight loss, because that seems to be probably the biggest thing I see, um, as far as the struggle that women have, um, during the menopause transition. And, you know, the problem with, with weight is that it's, it's almost always multifactorial. It's usually not just one single thing. And unfortunately there are all kinds of people and groups out there that want to peddle this and that you know, take this little pill or, you know, use this magic weight loss formula or do this crazy thing and the weight will just fall off of you. And, you know, honestly, that almost never works. And that's not what we're doing here. So it is true that hormone replacement therapy can really help with weight loss, in particular weight loss around the middle, which is a big change for a lot of people as they hit the menopause transition, the weight starts packing on in different spots. And it tends to go to the belly in the middle, and that's not what they're used to previously. And those are really metabolic changes. And hormone replacement therapy can help reverse those metabolic changes and you know, get that weight more what you were used to um, prior to the start of these hormone changes. And so it does work, um, but it's not sort of isolated in a bubble. Uh, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, I was laughing with my family about this, um, and that we know that there are, meta there are metabolic changes that happen as we age, and particularly for women in, 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 the, uh, in the menopause transition. And the proof of that, if you remember the old movie Freaky Friday uh, with Jamie Lee Curtis, there's this hilarious scene where she's now in the, the body of her child, and her kid is in her body, and her kid's eating french fries, and she's screaming, don't eat those, I'll never get that off my butt. Uh, and she suddenly realized that she's in a kid's body. It's like, ooh, I can eat French fries. Um, and so even like a Hollywood trope, um, we know this is true. This is a metabolism changes as we age and probably more for women than for men. And a lot of that has to do with the decrease in hormones because of the decrease of the um, efficiency of the ovaries. So the ovaries aren't making the hormones like they used to, the hormone levels drop and that really changes the metabolism. Replacing those hormones get your hormones back to where they were in your sort of youthful time and helps reverse those metabolic changes so that your weight can adjust more like they did, more like it did when, when you were young. But you know, it, you're never going to be like a 17 year old, no matter, no matter what you do that, that's just sort of the way it is. Uh, honestly, I don't really want to be like a 17 year old again, but, um, but I mean, maybe with the weight loss, I would, uh, but 
but you know, there's usually lots of issues going on. So the, the hormone replacement therapy is one part of that, and it's an important part, and it helps a lot. But you also have to eat right. You also have to exercise. It's you know hard work to lose weight, um, and so don't expect to just sort of do whatever you want and then take this medicine and the weight will drop off. That's really not the way it works. Um, my brother uh, has a PhD in math from UCLA. If you ask him, he'd tell you, well, weight loss is simple. It's just calories in, calories out, because he's kind of a math guy. And technically that's correct. Um, the problem is that calories out becomes very complicated um, because how we burn calories changes as we age. Um, and also for various other reasons. For instance, if your thyroid is off, that can that can affect the way you burn calories. Your hormones, when they're low, that affects the way you burn calories, which is why replacing the hormones helps. Um, but even the response to exercise and other things can change um, as we age, and there's many factors that can affect that calories out. And so it can be really difficult, um, and it's not always that simple. The other thing is the calories in can be challenging as well. So. You know, a lot of people tell me, well, I eat clean, I eat whole foods, um, you know, I, I, I eat, somebody today said, I eat tons of fruits and vegetables. It's like, well, that's great, that's healthy, but fruits and vegetables have a lot of calories too. Um, I mean, it's possible to eat, to gain weight doing nothing but eating grapes all day. Um, so you do have to be careful, um, not just what you eat, but also how much in calories. And then the last thing is looking, we all have our weaknesses. Some people it's sweet foods, some people it's starchy foods, some people it's um, salty foods. My problem, quantity. I kind of don't care what it is, I just want lots of it. Um, my son makes fun of me for this because he's a big foodie. Um, you know, I want to go to the buffet, he wants to go to the Michelin star restaurant. I'm happy as long as there's tons of food, he wants the really nice stuff. So we all have our issues. And so trying to identify those issues and then working on changing those and changing the patterns is so important. So I uh, just kind of wanted to start with that because it seems to be probably the, the most common thing I hear um, from our patients. Um, either they're very excited that they're losing the weight or they're frustrated because it doesn't seem to be coming off. Um, and I want to be honest about what we're selling. We're not selling magic beans. Um, we're selling real medicine and it really works, um, but it doesn't work in a bubble all by itself. So anyway, enough ranting, enough of that. Um, let's see uh, what your guys' questions are. So the first question comes from Mia. Is there a need to take blood work? I'm hearing you should be checked via blood work. So the answer is uh, absolutely. You do not need blood work for hormone replacement therapy. This is a, a misconception and it's gotten worse. And part of the reason I think is that the there's a huge cottage industry, a huge industry that's popped up of doing labs, um, labs for profit. And so um, you can, you know, spit in a tube or collect some hair or different things or even a finger prick and send it by mail and for a certain amount of money they'll give you this whole supposed health panel um, and so this is getting propagated um, not just by physicians but sort of by outside companies that are um, profit-based labs for hormones don't really help um, and the hormone levels really vary greatly from day to day and even within the day. And so it really depends on what time of day you've taken the test, when you've taken, you know, what day of the week or one of the month or in your cycle you've taken the test. And so the, the hormone levels aren't very accurate and therefore aren't very helpful. Hormone replacement therapy is really done by symptoms. So you tell me what your symptoms are and you're of the right age, it's pretty clear what the issue is. And then we know what hormones you need sort of in, in what combination to get you through these symptoms and get you feeling better. I have an algorithm um, that I developed uh, really over thousands of patients. Um, and then I fine tune it over a thousand more uh, that basically matches a bunch of different information, symptoms, past history, BMI, these kind of things, and generates a, a, a recommendation for which hormones and also a dosage. Uh, and it's pretty good. Uh, most of the time, I kind of hit it right on. I purposely shoot a little bit low because I'd rather start you on a lower dose than you need than overshoot and give you side effects. Um, and so we give that time to work, um, reassess your um, symptoms, usually about three months in, 10, 11 weeks in, and see how you're doing. And that's a good enough time to know whether this is the right dose and then adjust things as needed um, until we really 
dial it in um, and get you feeling your best. And this is way more accurate uh, than blood tests. There was an um, editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago that basically said, it was like screaming, stop ordering hormone levels for menopausal women. It's just not necessary. Uh, it's a big waste of money and it's not helpful. Um, so no, you, you really don't need um, lab tests. Unfortunately, they're a big source of income for um, some organizations and some people, um, but I'm not gonna ask you to do something just to make a profit unless it's gonna help you. Um, so that's a waste of time and money. Nope, oh, you're muted. Sorry, guys. We all got good at that over the last few years. Hold huh? on this. Yeah, over the last few years. <laughs> Hi, for perimenopausal women, are there any advantages to supplementing with bioidentical hormones over using hormonal birth control to balance hormones? I'm perimenopausal and I'm worried that adding hormones to a wildly fluctu fluctuating environment could make my symptoms worse. Great question. There's actually a couple of questions in there. So let's start with the birth control. The birth control pill question. Um, so birth control pills are designed to accomplish a totally different thing than hormone replacement therapy. Birth control pills are really designed to keep you from getting pregnant. And the way they do that is they basically overwhelm the ovary and shut the ovary down. And then the birth control pills take complete control of your hormonal milieu, or at least your female hormones. And that's why most birth control pills, you'll take them for usually 28 days and then have seven days of fake pills, or sometimes it's, you know, 30 days or 31 days, but they give you a little break and that break forces a period. Um, and that's because the dose is so high that it shuts the ovary down and you're not getting any contribution from the ovary. Hormone replacement therapy is not designed to do that. Hormone replacement therapy is designed to supplement the hormones that your ovaries are still making um, and just get your levels back up to a healthy level where you, you know, were a, a normal youthful level. They don't shut the ovary down. So you still get your natural hormones from your ovaries. Plus you're getting bioidentical hormones, which basically are the same hormones, but just a little bit more from the medication. The synthetic hormones in birth, all the birth control pills use synthetic hormones. And the synthetic hormones are, are, are really good at keeping you from getting pregnant. And they're actually very good at cycle control. They do better for that than hormone, than, than the bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, because that's what they're designed for. But they're not so good for menopausal and perimenopausal symptoms. And the reason is there's something called hormone receptors. And so the way the body recognizes the hormone is there's a little receptor. It's kind of like a, a, a a, a key and a lock and so there's a lock that the key fits in and then that key turns and the receptor says oh this is estrogen or what have you and it's not necessarily an all or nothing so the lock analogy isn't perfect um but uh something that's close even if it's not perfect will activate that receptor but it won't activate it completely so these synthetic hormones activate the receptors for the estrogen and the progesterone but they don't activate it completely and so they don't completely work on these symptoms Whereas the bioidentical hormones are a perfect match. So it's a perfect key for the lock. And you turn that and the receptor identifies it. Yes, this is the real deal. And it's able to completely give those signals to the brain, which activates other hormones. And basically it's able to get those symptoms um, under control that birth control pills won't. So I have a lot of patients on birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy. I gotta be honest with you. At first I didn't totally understand this, and then it was like, well, okay, I'll try it. And it works. Um, I'll have a lot of patients that have gotten relief that way. And then I had to think out the physiology and this is what I realized, this is why it works. Um, so there's logic behind it and, and physiology. I'll tell you a funny story about the lock and key just because it's kind of amusing. Um, back in college, I used to drive this beater um, Datsun B210. Um, and uh, in fact, it was the old Honey Bee. It was just like a piece of junk on wheels, but it ran forever. So it was a perfect college car. And my best friend, he had a 240Z, you know, and he had poured it out. I mean, it was like a racing car. And the funny thing was my Datsun B210 key would open, would unlock the door of, her, of his 240Z. Um, that's why I used to tease him. Datsun's a Datsun. Um, the key would not start his car, however. So it's sort of like that, you know, it would work for the door, but it wouldn't quite work to start his car. And that's how these synthetic hormones are. They sort of work um, and, and they function to some extent, but they don't function completely, whereas the bioidenticals do. So that's 
kind of the deal with birth control pills and bioidenticals and the difference. The other part of your question is also really important, and it's this idea of, of like wildly fluctuating hormones. And you're right, that is a lot of what causes problems in the perimenopausal period. So the ovary is still trying to make hormones, but it's just not very good at it anymore because it's sort of getting old and, and it's not as efficient. And so it'll sort of spit out a bunch of hormone and then it won't be able to as much and then it'll do it again. And so you get these big fluctuations in your hormone levels and that gives a lot of the symptoms. Hot flashes, for instance, are thought to be because of these big fluctuations. And that's one of the ways that hormone replacement therapy is really helpful because you get this sort of underlying steady state of hormone from the hormone replacement therapy that's always there in the background and so it mutes these fluctuations so these fluctuations aren't as great because even when you have these troughs and these peaks you still have this underlying amount of hormone that keeps sort of everything in check and so it, it, it's actually sort of the opposite of kind of what you were thinking is that because of the wild fluctuations these big fluctuating hormones hormone replacement therapy comes alongside and helps mute that and, and cause less of an issue with your body. And that's one of the big ways that it does relieve symptoms. I hope that makes sense. Our next question is from Blanca, 50 years old, dieting and working out every day, but can't lose weight. So this goes back to what you're talking about before. Yeah. Never had issues before. My hot flashes are better, sleeping better. Can your product help? And what do you recommend? So the answer is, um, it probably can help. I assume um, you're not on other hormone replacement therapy right now. Um, so a combination of estrogen, um, possibly progesterone, depending on whether you have the uterus, and testosterone or testosterone supplement. So we use DHEA um, as our testosterone. And, and for a couple of reasons, the real practical reason is testosterone is a controlled substance, and we can't do that on the platform that we have. But really, I do this in my practice as well. Um, I saw a lady yesterday that I um, started on DHEA rather than testosterone. And the reason is it's a much safer and gentler way of providing testosterone. So it'll get testosterone levels kind of to normal levels, but at the doses that I prescribe, it's not going to push it and cause big testosterone side effects. And so these hormones can help overcome these metabolic changes. So, you know, like you're experiencing and um, sort of, like I said, with Freaky Friday, um, you know, you never used to have problems before. You could diet and exercise and weight would come off. And now all of a sudden, the things that you were doing isn't working anymore. Um, and the weight's not coming off like it used to. You're still, you know, you know, in the big picture, your calories in are you're decreased. Your calories out are, are increased because you're exercising. But you're, you're not getting that same metabolic benefit that you used to get. And the hormone replacement therapy can, can come in and supplement that and help get that metabolism much more like it was when you were younger. And so, yeah, there's a pretty good chance this could work. Now, you never really know till you try because every body is so unique. Um, but I have a lot of patients um, that have had um, very good success with this um, in losing weight. Um, so my opinion is, yeah, I think it can probably help you even if your hot flashes are okay and you're sleeping okay. If you still have this other thing, that's something that we can help. The next question is from Alicia. She's been taking Monona for about three weeks and she's asking, is it normal to have very odd dreams? I had a panic attack from a dream. I've never been an anxious person or have had this issue. My poor husband was a trooper. Okay, so I can tell you what's going on um, almost certainly. Um, for the vast majority of people, taking the medicine at night is beneficial because particularly progesterone makes people sleepy and it helps them sleep at night. There's a small percentage, I think it's about 5%, maybe a little bit less, where the progesterone activates people and sometimes causes these funny dreams and these sort of panic attacks at night. Um, and so I would recommend try taking this in the morning. Um, it'll probably fix the problem. So this this, this does happen occasionally. Um, it's not that common, but it, it's not that rare either. And I'll bet you that's what's going on. So the simple solution is just switch to using it in the morning. Um, and that should solve the problem. Uh, I can tell you a, a funny story about that if you if you'd like, but I guess you don't have a choice because <laughs> here I am. Um, uh, I, uh, we went on a, a mission trip, and um, uh, we did a, a medical. I've done several medical mission trips, uh, but on one of them we were taking a malaria drug that was sort of famous for causing these crazy nightmares, crazy dreams, um, and it was a once a week drug. And I was rooming with another doc who's a, a good friend of mine. And um, so he and I were on the same schedule. And that the week where we would take 
that pill we go, oh, we're going to have some crazy dreams tonight, you know, and it was just sort of predictable. And for some people, progesterone can have that effect. Not most, um, but there is a small percentage of people that does that. And, and, I, and I bet that's what's happening. So taking it in the morning should solve that problem. I think I took that same drug when I went to India. So you did take it once a week. Yeah, that would, yeah. And then you had to take it for another month after you got home. Yeah, yep, yep. exactly. I took that same thing. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from Victoria. What are the dangers of hormone replacement therapy? So that's a great question. Um, there's no free lunch. <laughs> so everything in life has risk. Uh, in the appropriately screened patient, the risk of hormone replacement therapy is very small. There's definitely some risk. There's a slight increased risk of getting a blood clot, like what's called a DVT, a blood clot in your leg, or a PE, which is really scary, which is a blood clot in the lung. That risk is really small. Um, it's much less, for instance, than the risk from taking birth control pills. And most people never really think about that when they start birth control pills. Um, and so that's a, a really small risk. There's also probably a slight increased risk of breast cancer. Um, that's actually controversial, believe it or not. Um, but I think the data adds up that there probably is a very slight increased risk, particularly um, women that are on estrogen and progesterone. However, there's a protective effect. Your, your risk of getting uterine cancer is much less. Your risk of getting colon cancer is much less. So your risk of getting any cancer actually is less taking hormone replacement therapy than not taking hormone replacement therapy because of the effect on the colon and the uterus and, and, and maybe other organs as well. But those are the ones that are, are sort of known for sure. And those sort of balance out and, and with interest, the slight increased risk of breast cancer. Um, you know, whenever we say breast cancer, it's a scary thing, obviously. Um, and so um, somebody that has a genetic predisposition to breast cancer probably shouldn't be taking hormone replacement therapy. On the other hand, there's a couple of very large studies that say that women that have a family history of breast cancer it, are, are actually perfectly safe to take hormone replacement therapy as long as they don't personally have had a breast cancer or, you know, a BRCA gene or a Lynch syndrome, one of these genetic predispositions to cancer, that would probably be a bad idea. The other thing that's interesting is that, and, and this was confusing at first, women that start HRT for the first time, age 60 or older, have an increased risk of cardiovascular problems, so like heart heart attack or stroke. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that data was what, what they noticed was it was only the first two years. So women, let's say that you were 70 and you started hormone replacement therapy. Those first two years, you had a real increased risk of a heart attack or a stroke. But if you got through those first two years and didn't have that problem, then your risk was at least the same, if not a little bit better than women in the general population. On the other hand, women without pre-existing heart disease who start hormone replacement therapy before 60 have a decreased risk of cardiovascular um, events compared to women um, that have never been on hormone replacement therapy. And, and that's where the this older study called the Women's Health Initiative study really kind of misled everybody um, because they had women all the way up to 79 in their study and their study said, hey, there's an increased risk of heart attack and stroke with the medicine. But when it was really looked at, and they've done more studies to look at this, it turns out there was sort of an age difference and that cutoff in age was age 60. So at Winona, we won't prescribe hormone replacement therapy for women 60 or over um, because of this increased risk. So for women under 60 that are appropriately screened, appropriate candidates for hormone replacement therapy, your life expectancy is actually longer than that if you never took hormone replacement therapy and your quality of life tends to be better because it helps all these symptoms. There are other benefits, for instance, osteoporosis. Um, estrogen is really good at preventing osteoporosis. Honestly, if you have osteoporosis, there are other drugs that probably work better um, specifically for that, but estrogen is a great preventative medicine. Now, maybe not enough to start estrogen for no other reason, but it's sort of a side, you know, it's a bonus um, if you're taking it um, for your uh, menopausal symptoms. So again, there are risks, they're very small and an appropriately screened patient and somebody that has you know, low risk factors as of the right age, um, your, your benefits are much, much outweigh your risks. Our next question is from Miriam. Hi everyone, I've been using the estrogen progesterone cream for about one month now. 
The weight gain is stopped. Oh, that's great to hear. And I've noticed my symptoms of frozen shoulder have nearly cleared up after about a year of pain and limited mobility. I'm starting to feel better and energy has increased. Can a lot of joint pain be related to menopause? Please comment. Thank you. Yeah, so joint pain um, is interesting because it's another one of these multifactorial things. But menopause certainly can increase um, inflammation. Um, and we know that um, estrogen in particular and also progesterone are anti-inflammatories. So if there's a lot of joint inflammation and your hormones are low, um, replacing the, the hormones um, can work as an anti-inflammatory and really benefit your joint health. Um, and so this is pretty common where women have joint pain. Sometimes, sometimes I'll people, other people kind of tell me all surprised, like, well, my hot flash is better, but like, I'm surprised my joint pain got better. I like, didn't expect that. Um, and so that is a, a benefit of hormone replacement therapy. Now, there are lots of reasons for joint pain that have nothing to do with your hormones. Um, you know, so, um, you know, for instance, I, I've got a, a, a bad knee um, and um, it's not because my estrogen levels are low. It's because I squat and deadlifted too heavy in the gym and kind of messed my knees up. Um, so, you know, if I take estrogen, that's not going to help me. Um, but there definitely is a component, um, you know, of uh, joint pain that can be relieved with hormone replacement therapy. So that's kind of a, a, a pretty common thing that you're experiencing. I haven't heard that one yet with all of the symptoms. We actually have an ebook that talks about like there's a hundred plus symptoms of menopause and I'll link that in the chat, but I haven't yet to hear that the one about joint pain. Interesting. Okay, so our next question is from Jessica. I started with the estrogen cream and DHEA three months ago and I'm very bloated. Will this resolve? Um, so I am getting a signal that I have a connection problem. So if I drop, I apologize. Um, I'm still okay, Liv? Yeah, you're good. Okay, I got this ugly pop-up on my screen here. Um, sorry, I, uh, I forgot what we were talking about. I apologize. I oh, got no distracted worries. by this thing. Um, um, oh, bloated, about... bloated, bloated, right. Yeah, bloated. So bloating is, is pretty common at the beginning. Um, and, um, but for most people by the three month mark, the, the bloating has resolved. Um, so if you're still bloated at the three month mark, um, it's possible that we may need to decrease the, uh, the dose of the hormone. So again, you know, there's sort of a fine line between getting all the benefit, but not overshooting and getting, um, some of the complications. So bloating in the first few weeks, even month is pretty common. And that usually sort of goes away with time. Um, and, but by three months, I would expect that you sort of are going to get what you're going to get. And so if you're still having a significant amount of bloating and it occurred just sort of when you started the hormone replacement therapy, um, then backing off a bit on the dose, um, may solve that. And hopefully you'll still have, um, the, uh, the symptom control that you're getting. Uh, on the other hand, there are other reasons for bloating as well. Um, and so, you know, you might want to think, you know, um, did this really start when I started the HRT? If it was pre-existing, and this just sort of made it worse, then there could be something else, you know, um, that's causing the bloating. You know, a, a GI issue or something like that. Um, so again, this is not the, the only thing that causes bloating, but if it's temporary related, it's like I never had bloating, started this, now I got bloating. It's probably that's what it's from. And and backing back a bit off the disc may fix the problem. I'm gonna hit this refresh page. I'm sort of afraid to do it, um, but if I drop, I'll be right back. Okay. It's just me. Um, we will be answering Victoria, your question next, once he pops back on. I wish I could see all of your guys' faces because it's just me on here right now and I have to look at the chat. 
Your opinion. Here we go. I'm so sorry. Get this. So it made me re-log in and then it made me change my password. How much do you guys like that? Huh? You must change your password every six months. That's six what months. it said to me too. I was like, what an inconvenient time. Yeah, you were in the middle of a program. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry, you guys. I, uh, but it looked like it was crashing and I wanted to make sure it worked. That's funny. Um, Victoria has our next question. So she said, what are the possible side effects that you refer to while dialing the right dose? So um, for estrogen, uh, breast tenderness um, is kind of a clue that we may be overshooting. Um, bloating that doesn't go away. Uh, I don't see it very often, but rarely headaches. Um, that's, that's pretty unusual. Um, those are um, sort of the biggest we see with estrogen. For the DHEA, uh, acne uh, sometimes happens at first, um, usually goes away pretty quickly. Um, but if that doesn't resolve or it gets significantly worse, that can mean that our DHEA dose is, is too high. Um, and then um, sometimes uh, some uh, facial hair with the DHEA can happen, although usually not with the doses um, that we prescribe. If you, if you go online and you look up DHEA, it's going to scare you because um, DHEA is a drug of abuse for, no, I shouldn't say drug of abuse. It's a drug that really works. Um, that people use in the bodybuilding community and other sports communities um, for, uh, you know, for, for competitive advantage. But they're using these giant mega doses um, and this, it works. And in fact, a lot of uh, sports organizations ban DHEA as a drug because of that. Um, we're using it in a teeny, like a tenth or even less, a twentieth of the dose that these athletes are using. So it's not going to cause these kind of side effects that you read about. These side effects that you're reading about are mostly from these mega doses that people are using, um, that are, are using it as a performance enhancing drug. Um, so, um, uh, but you know, if we overshoot, it can cause some of these side effects. Um, but like I said, I usually try to, if anything, I try to hit it right on. Um, but if anything, I try to be a little bit on the, the lower side than the higher side, because I'd rather increase your dose and get your symptoms under control than have to back down because you're on the side of things. Okay. Oh, sorry. I think bouncing all over the place. Um, Mary Lou, this one goes back to the blood work. She needs more clarification clarification on why blood work is not needed for hormone replacement therapy. So um, blood work doesn't tell you, does, blood work doesn't do a good job of really telling you where your hormones are all the time. It gives you a snapshot of what your hormone level is the moment they did the blood work. As I talked about earlier, one of the big problems with the menopause transition is those hormones fluctuate greatly up and down. And that's really what causes a lot of the symptoms is this huge fluctuation. So for instance, hot flashes is really thought to be from these, these sort of peaks and troughs, these giant fluctuations in estrogen levels. And those actually go away once you go through menopause completely. So eventually your ovaries completely shut down. They stop making any of these hormones. And then you don't get fluctuations. You just have basically none of this. You have a little bit from other tissue, but you have very little of this circulating around. And the hot flashes usually go away at that point. The others sometimes get worse, but the hot flashes themselves go away because those are due to these big fluctuations. So if you think about drawing blood, you're basically taking a snapshot at time. Um, and so you could be at the peak of one of these fluctuations, or you could be at the bottom of one of these fluctuations, or you could be in the middle of these fluctuations. Um, and so that number doesn't really tell you sort of what's going on all the time. It tells you what's going on at that moment in time. And that's not necessarily going to tell you anything about what your symptoms are or how much hormone you need or if you need hormone at all. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm on blood pressure medication. So the symptom of needing blood pressure medication is my blood pressure was too high. Um, so my doctor didn't order blood tests 
that's not completely true. There's blood tests that you order with high blood pressure to make sure that there isn't something else causing that high blood pressure, but you don't order blood tests to decide what dose of medicine you use. So he started me on medicine um, and I followed my blood pressure and it wasn't enough and he increased that and it still wasn't enough and he added another medicine and eventually we got my blood pressure under control. But we didn't do it with blood work, we did it by watching my symptoms. My symptom in this case was high blood pressure. And so in the same way, that's how we treat menopause. Um, you tell me your symptoms. Your symptoms guide me to tell what kind of medicine to start you on. We put you on that medicine. We monitor your symptoms. Your symptoms get better and we know, okay, we got it right. Or your symptoms don't get better. It's like, okay, we need to push this a little farther or occasionally we need to start a different medicine or um, kind of change the approach that we're doing. But blood work doesn't really enter into it. There's a lot of things we do that way in medicine. Um, Honestly, you know, sometimes you don't think about it. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, when I had to start blood pressure medicine, it's like, okay, well, this is kind of the same thing. Um, and so uh, that's the way we do hormone replacement therapy. It's the correct way to do it. Um, it doesn't mean there aren't people out there ordering blood tests because there are. And honestly, some of it is because patients want it. Um, so, you know, it's easier to do what a patient wants than to try to explain why it's not necessary. Um, and so I know, you know, in a busy office practice, for instance, it's easier to just hand them a blood slip than to spend 20 minutes trying to explain why they don't need the blood work if somebody really insists they want blood work. And so people just say, okay, fine. And they write you for blood work. doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It doesn't mean it's going to be helpful, um, but it's the way a doctor gets through their day, unfortunately. So that's a little kind of peek behind the curtain um, of, of what goes on. Um, it's not the ideal way to do medicine, but unfortunately it's sort of a practical way. Um, I don't have that same constraint really um, because it's a different situation um, with Winona, the way we interact. So, um, you know, I don't order blood tests because they're not useful. It's a waste of your money and it's a waste of your time. Um, on the other hand, I've had patients that have gotten blood tests. I'm happy to look it over with them, um, you know, and explain, you know, what I'm seeing, but I don't put a lot of faith in what the blood tests are showing quite honestly. Makes sense. The next question is from Susan Waters. Do you offer bioidentical? Yes, that's all we offer. So um, all of our hormones are bioidentical hormones. Um, I think they work better. Um, there isn't hard data for this, but it makes sense that they should have less side effects and less risk. There isn't really big studies that prove that, but it sort of makes logical sense that if you sort of give your body the identical thing that your body makes, it's probably going to work better and work cleaner. Um, and have less, less issues. Um, but yeah, so we made a decision that we only use bioidentical hormones, um, honestly, because they're the thing that works the best. Um, and my wife's on hormone replacement, so she's on Winona Medicine. Um, uh, her, uh, she went in for her annual and her, her doctor offered her um, non-bioidentical hormones. She came home and asked me, I'm like, no, stick with the bioidenticals, they're working. Um, they're probably better for you. The next question is from Angelica. Hi, recently I ran across a friend who is also on bioidentical HRT. She said that it's not safe to start HRT unless you've gone a full year without a period. Is there truth, truth to this? I believe I started HRT sometime around a year, but may have not been exact. Yeah, there's not truth to that. In fact, that's completely opposite. Um, so a year without a period is the definition of menopause. Uh, and so I know there are doctors out there that tell you, oh, you've got to be in full menopause before you should start HRT. And honestly, that's nonsense. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, as I said before, you really need to start before age 60. And, I, you know, the younger, the better, um, because it decreases your risk of cardiovascular disease. And here's the idea on this. This is what we think is happening. And, and it, it fits with all the data that's been collected is that Hormone replacement therapy helps protect against cardiovascular disease. The longer a woman is without, you know, with the ovaries aren't making enough hormone and she's not on hormone replacement therapy. And so she has a deficiency in, you know, estrogen particularly, but in the female hormones, that cardiovascular disease is building up and building up. If you look at women premenopausal, they have much less cardiovascular disease than men. If you look at postmenopausal women, they basically catch up. And we think it's the estrogen that's protective um, for the heart. And so the longer you go without that protective estrogen, the more chance that you're getting this sort of 
cardiovascular disease that, that isn't symptomatic yet, but is sort of growing and, and going on. And that's why in the Women's Health Initiative study, older women, women over 60, those first two years are a big risk because now you've got underlying cardiovascular disease, you start the hormone and boom, you cause a heart attack. The ones that didn't have that problem and got through that sort of first two years, now they've gotten two years of benefit of the estrogen, it's helped them and so now their risk is back to being low. And so again, starting hormone replacement therapy early is gonna help decrease that risk of cardiovascular disease. And in some cases, I mean, you don't wanna start it when you're 20, because you, you have enough estrogen. But if you start it when your estrogen levels are starting to taper off, you're gonna get benefit from that right away. You're also gonna get the osteoporosis benefit and, and other benefits as well. And, and that's just like the less important part. The most important part is you wouldn't be here if you weren't having symptoms that are affecting your quality of life. Um, and so you're having these symptoms, you know, there's, like we said, there's over a hundred different symptoms it could be. Maybe you're having hot flashes or night sweats, or maybe you're not sleeping well at night. Um, or maybe you're having vaginal dryness and, 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 and sex is uncomfortable. Maybe your libido's down. Or maybe all of a sudden out of nowhere, you're gaining weight around your middle and you never had that before. Maybe you have brain fog and, and it's affecting your, you know, how you're working. Um, there's all these different things that can be going on because of your decreased hormone levels. Adding hormone replacement therapy fixes those symptoms and gets you feeling good again. Why wait this arbitrary period of 12 months after your last period to get those symptoms under control. The sooner you start them, the sooner you get those symptoms under control, the sooner you get your life back. And on top of that, there's these underlying health benefits that are sort of a bonus. So yes, the definition of menopause is 12 months without a period, but you don't have to be in full-blown menopause to start hormone replacement therapy. It's actually beneficial to start it in the perimenopausal period that period before full-blown menopause when the hormone levels are fluctuating and going down and so that you can feel better. Um, so, um, you know, you can tell your, your friend that or um, probably won't listen to you, uh, but you can watch the video because we will post this. Um, but really, there's just no reason to wait that long. Um, and, and there's no benefit and there's certainly risk and, you know, you're suffering all the time. What's the point? The next question is from Angela. If you have to take birth control because of endometriosis, can you still take the hormones and DHEA? Yes. So endometriosis tends to get triggered by fluctuating hormones. Um, and so, you know, birth control is going to keep a steady level of hormone, um, and that's going to keep endometriosis in check. Hormone replacement, so if we add hormone replacement therapy, bioidentical hormones to that, we're still keeping a steady level of hormones, a little bit higher than it was before, but it's still a nice steady level and it shouldn't affect the endometriosis. As I talked before, um, the hormone replacement therapy has benefits to menopausal symptoms that birth control pills alone don't. And so you're gonna get some benefit from the hormone replacement therapy that you're not gonna get from the birth control. You're still gonna have a steady amount of hormone and so it shouldn't trigger your endometriosis. So it should, should be safe to do. And, and yes, I think you can get benefit from it. Our next question is from Karen. I am three months in for cream and one month DHEA and having extreme emotional swings when I would have been in my period cycle. Is this the right dose? Probably not. Um, if, if you're still having emotional swings, it's probably not the right dose. And um, depending on sort of when those happened in relation to your medication, you know, would be how we would vary the medicine. So I would expect the hormone replacement therapy to be beneficial for those mood swings, um, those hormonal swings. The easy answer is you probably need to increase the dose of the cream a bit. Um, that's the most likely thing to work. Um, the only hesitation I have is that you started the DHEA just a month ago. It's rare, it's less than 1%, um, but occasionally DHEA throws people's emotions off. 99% of the time you don't see that, but I have had a handful of patients that take the DHEA and it just throws them into emotional ability. So if this was predating the DHEA, then the answer is going to be to increase your, um, your dose of your cream. If this started after you started the DHEA, I'd be a little suspicious that it could be the DHEA doing this. And in that case, the answer would be stop the DHEA for a few weeks and see how you feel. And that, if that, see if that takes care of the problem or not. So that's the way um, I would kind of think about um, this problem. 
Diamond said, 44, just had a blood panel and was told my numbers are not in premenopausal range, but had a hysterectomy in 2015. I still have my ovaries. Would you recommend Winona with that feedback, even though I have symptoms, sweating, hot flashes, ETC? Also, my gyno recommended patches and not cream. Thoughts? So, yeah. So my thoughts is that's a really interesting story because... Um, on the one hand, your gyno is telling you you're not in the perimental puzzle range, but your gyno is offering you hormone replacement therapy. So your gyno agrees with me um, that the blood tests aren't really useful. I'm not sure why they ordered them um, because they're they're not relying on them. So uh, again, you know, with the blood tests, the, the way I, I approach testing is I ask myself, what am I going to do if the answer if the test comes up positive? What am I going to do if the test comes up negative? If the answer is the same. Why would I order the test? So in this case, um, somebody ordered this test. Um, the test said, you don't need hormone replacement therapy. And what they do, they offered you hormone replacement therapy. So clearly whoever ordered the test or maybe someone else ordered it and they kind of got stuck with it. But your gyno agrees with me that these tests aren't really helpful in determining who needs hormone replacement therapy. It's the symptoms. And clearly you've got symptoms um, that would benefit from hormone replacement therapy. Um, Theoretically, having a hysterectomy without removing your ovaries should not speed up the menopause transition. But in practice, it doesn't seem to be the case. And there's a lot of women who have hysterectomies, even with the ovaries retained, that seem to go into menopause more early than they would have. And I think it has to do with the blood supply to the ovary. It's kind of a complicated anatomical thing. Most of the blood supply of the ovary is, is um, completely separate from the uterus, but there is a small amount, a small contribution from the uterus. And I think that, you know, in the course of surgery, you lose that small blood supply, may interrupt some other blood supply um, or even potentially damage the ovary. And I've seen this pretty commonly that women that have a hysterectomy tend to have these symptoms a little bit earlier than women that don't. Um, so I agree with your gynecologist. Um, it sounds like you would benefit from hormone replacement therapy. So now the question is, cream, patch, pills, what's going to work best for you? And the truth is they all work well. Um, and so it sort of comes down to individual preference. So uh, the patches um, are more expensive than the cream. Um, the pills are sort of in between. Uh, and there is a theoretical benefit to the patches and the cream in that they bypass what's called first pass metabolism. Um, that is, when you take a pill, that pill goes through your stomach and your intestines and gets absorbed and that blood goes first to the liver and then it gets distributed to the rest of the body and that's called first pass metabolism the liver is responsible for breaking down these medications and eventually eliminating them so when it goes to the liver first a big chunk of this gets broken down right away before it goes off to the general circulation when we give medicine through the skin it goes into the general circulation first and then eventually kind of gets to the liver. And so you get a lot more bang for your buck and you have to use less medication um, to get a you know, the same effect. And also it's a little bit less taxing on your liver because it doesn't get this medicine all at once. So it tends to be gentler on your lipids, your cholesterol, that kind of thing. Also, if there's any kind of liver issues, it tends to be gentler on the liver issues. Honestly, to, to be quite honest, that's more of a theoretical concern for the vast majority of people, it's really not that important, um, but it's there. And for some people, it, it is beneficial. So, you know, cream versus patch, the cream, you know, you, you put a little bit on at night or in the morning, but mostly at night before you go to bed each day. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, the patch uh, you put on twice a week and you leave it on. Um, and that's pretty simple, too. So, you know, what's more annoying, having to put a little cream on every day or having to wear a patch all the time? I don't know, it kind of depends on, on your personality. Um, also, again, at least through Winona, because we compound the creams ourselves, we have a, a, we have a, a lot more ability to sort of structure things in, in, in a ratio and in ways that's gonna help you um, and, and dosing it that way um, than the patches. It also helps us keep costs down so we can provide the cream at a much lower cost than the patches. Um, but the, nothing wrong with the patches um, and um, that's a, a reasonable way to go. Um, so that's sort of my thoughts on, on, on your situation. I think, yeah, you'd probably benefit from hormone replacement therapy and 
what style, whether that's a cream or a patch or a pill, is, is really going to depend on, on works, what works best for you personally. The next question is from Karen. Are there supplements to avoid taking while on this? Not really. Um, I'm not a big supplement fan. Um, there's honestly very little data from most of the supplements. DHEA is a, is a, is a, a big exception to this. There's actually a lot of data on DHEA and, and it is beneficial. Um, but most of the supplements that people take, you know, there, there isn't really good studies um, that say whether they work um, and whether they're dangerous. Most of them aren't dangerous or they'd be off the market by now. So, excuse me, for the most part, supplements are safe. Um, although every once in a while, you know, something makes the news where there was some supplement that harmed people, but that's pretty, pretty rare. So where supplements hurt you really is in the pocketbook and in the amount of time you spend taking them. So, you know, they can be expensive um, and they can be a hassle. Some of the some of the lists of supplements I see some of our patients on are pretty daunting. And it's like, wow, how do you manage to take all that stuff every day? Um, and honestly, there's just not a lot of data for them. They don't tend to interact with um, the hormones in the Winona products. So they're safe to take. Um, what I tell patients is, yeah, it's safe to use these. I'm hoping that once the hormone replacement kicks in and you're feeling better, you won't feel that you need them anymore. And you can save yourself a little bit of money um, by stopping them. But if you're a supplement kind of person and you really like supplements, um, there really isn't any interaction that we have to worry about um, with the supplements and the um, hormone replacement therapy. Our next question is from Carly. If I had ovarian cancer 15 years ago, is it safe to be doing this? Uh, that's one of these, there's a right answer on the test and then there's a practical answer. The right answer on the test is probably uh, the practical answer is, honestly, I wouldn't feel comfortable prescribing it for you. Um, and, and the reason is it's complicated um, and it's a little unfair. Um, but in the type of environment that we're supplying on our platform, it, you know, we're able to safely prescribe hormone replacement therapy, again, for appropriately screened patients. I'll be honest with you, we kind of cherry pick. You know, we, we, we have young, healthy people that tend to do well because my most important is I don't want to cause a problem for you. Um, like, I'd love to make you feel better, but it, I, I don't want to make a problem for you. That would be terrible. And so your safety is the most important thing. Ovarian cancer in general is usually safe to use HRT, but it's kind of a scary thing. And um, it sort of depends on the type of cancer. It depends on what's happened since, depends on what happened then, what kind of surgery you had. There's a lot of little subtleties um, that I can't really get into on this platform. And so I would not feel comfortable um, on the Monona platform prescribing hormone replacement therapy. It's a little different than I would do in the office, quite honestly. And I'll give you an example. Um, on Monona, we draw a tight line in the sand. If you're 60 years and a day, I won't prescribe, I won't give you a new prescription for HRT on Monona because that's considered contraindicated. Now, Logically, there's no difference between being 59 and 364 days and 60 and one day. I mean, give me a break, okay? But you have to draw a line somewhere. And on a platform like this, we need to draw a firm line and stand on it. So I saw a patient in the office yesterday. She was 60 and like three months and was really suffering um, from uh, symptoms of perimenopause, symptoms of menopause. And we had a long conversation. I explained this to her. I was able to kind of go into the subtleties. Um, and we probably spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes talking about this. And ultimately I wrote a prescription for hormone replacement therapy. That's a luxury I have in the office that I don't really have on a platform like this. So for someone like you, um, I would encourage you to seek out a gynecologist that's comfortable with hormone replacement therapy um, and, and do a sort of in-person thing. They're gonna wanna see you know, the type of cancer you had. They're going to want to kind of see the care you've had, the complications you may have had to make sure that this isn't going to cause you a problem. But I don't really feel that I can safely do it um, through Winona. Sorry. Well, that's, that's good to know. Um, also, just to notice, Dr. Green, we have about four minutes left. So oh. we'll, in order to get through all of these, we have to keep them a, a little brief. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, no worries. It's detailed. Are all menopausal women candidates for HRT? Who wouldn't be? So, no, they aren't. So, um, 
Uh, women have uncontrolled high blood pressure um, wouldn't be a candidate. If you have on medication, your blood pressure control, that's fine. Women with can history of cancer, um, I mean, specifically breast um, cancer, uterine cancer, as we talked about ovarian cancer, um, you know, female cancers um, would not be a candidate for this. Women with a history of stroke would not be a candidate. With Women with a history of significant heart disease, like a heart attack, wouldn't be a candidate. Um, women um, that have had a blood clot like a DVT or a what's called a PE, which is a blood clot to the lung or pulmonary embolism, they wouldn't be a candidate. So women that are on um, blood thinners, generally they're on blood thinners for one of these reasons, they wouldn't be candidates. So those are, there's a lot of health issues um, that make hormone replacement therapy unsafe. And so in the onboarding, we ask you all these questions and then honestly kick you out if you answer yes to those because we don't want to cause you a problem. Um, so again, all this stuff I'm talking about, the safety of hormone replacement therapy is for appropriately screened patients, patients that don't have these underlying problems um, that can increase the risk, which is the vast majority of people, fortunately. But unfortunately, there are some people that have medical issues that make this unsafe. The next question is from Victoria. How long does a person typically have to continue HRT? Um, so, uh, and let me just say an aside real quick. I'm happy to stand a little bit longer if that's okay. I know I told you I had this thing at the hospital, but I can wait. That's more so. Okay. <laughs> so I'm okay going long. I want to get everybody's questions answered. Um, so on average, the average woman's on HRT for five years, but that varies tremendously. Um, some people a year, some people their whole life. I mean, it really depends how long it takes, you know, to get these symptoms under control and, and, different women have different needs. And so my recommendation is after being on it for a few years, two, three years, kind of depending on your age, you might try going off of it for a month or two. I would choose a time when you don't have like a lot of stress in your life or something like really important to do and, and stop and see how you feel. Your body's going to tell you whether you need to go back on it. If you feel the same, then there's no point restarting it. Um, if all of a sudden all these symptoms come back, then we get you back on it. Um, and so that's kind of what I would recommend. And then if you find that you need to go back on it, then every year or two, you can try that experiment again. And eventually you may find that, hey, you know what? I graduated and I don't need this anymore. But five years is the, the average amount of time. But it's there's a huge range, um, a huge variance in that. The next question is from Rhonda. How do you choose the dose when screening a patient? How, to, how do you know if 25 milligrams... Is it enough or too much? Doesn't DHEA create mimic testosterone? So two questions there. So yes, that's why we use the DHEA. So DHEA breaks down into estrogen and testosterone. It's the testosterone that we're after. Um, that's what we're using it for. There is also an estrogen benefit. Um, and actually, if you go online, you're going to see that people say, if you're on estrogen, you should not be using DHEA. And that's because it can, it adds estrogen. But if the same person is prescribing the DHA and the estrogen, they know to adjust the estrogen dose appropriately for the DHEA. Um, so it's really not an issue here. Um, so the, I'll be honest with you, the DHEA dose, I pretty much start everybody on 25 milligrams um, because I know it's a safe dose. It works for the vast majority of patients. Some patients, I don't have a hard number for this, but I would guess maybe 20% end up needing to go up on that dose. Um, it's pretty rare for somebody where that's gonna to be too much. So we sort of, for DHA, we kind of start everybody on 25. The cream or the pills or the patch, there's a lot more variation and it really has to do with this type of symptoms you're having um, and some of the other um, uh, medical issues and you know your size and that kind of thing as to what dose we use for estrogen and progesterone. And I do have, like I said, I, I develop an algorithm for that, that that seems to work pretty well. The DHA, honestly, pretty much start everybody on 25 milligrams because it's, it's a, it's a dose that works for most people. It's a really safe dose. It's not going to push the testosterone out of the normal range. Um, but it will take somebody with a low testosterone and get them into that normal range of testosterone for a woman. Um, and so, um, it's, it's, it's a really good starting dose. Anything less than that tends not to help much. So I know there, you know, I have some patients come in on 20, I'm sorry, on 10 milligrams of DHEA. And honestly, that's almost a placebo dose. It's just not enough to really make a difference. Um, so I think 25 is a good starting point. Alicia, just so you know, says, thank you. I'm feeling better than I did for sure. It takes time for your body to adjust. I do realize and I'm very happy I found Winona. That's great to hear. Yeah, thanks. Really? Oh, these are just responding to other people. 
Naomi says, hello, I'm currently taking pellets, but looking to switch over due to a thyroid thyroidectomy. Any information on this to switch over? Yeah, so um, no offense, but I've never really understood what the draw is to pellet therapy. I mean, it's such an invasive way of doing HRT. I know it's sort of the hot thing out there, um, but to me, I don't know, I wouldn't want to do it. Um, but you know, if you like it, God bless you. Um, the problem with pellet therapy, as you know, is you need to go in and you get this big needle shoved in you and a pellet injected underneath your skin. Um, and then that pellet takes sort of three to four months to wear off. And then you do the whole process again. The issues come if it's the wrong dose or you have a reaction to it, or it just makes you feel lousy or it's not working. Um, there's no way to get rid of it. So you're sort of stuck with this for this amount of time. Whereas more traditional hormone replacement therapy, like the cream or the patch or the pill, if you have a side effect or it's not working or there's problems with it, you just stop taking it and it's gone. It's out of your circulation in a day or two. Um, and that's the end of it. Uh, the, the medications that we use are very similar to the medications that are used in most pellet therapy. Um, although I have seen some interesting um, combinations of medicine um, that people sometimes use for pellets. I'm not quite sure why, but in general, I mean, it, it's usually, you know, the same estrogen, progesterone and testosterone um, in general is what people use with pellet therapy. And so the switchover is pretty easy, really. Um, we just start you on the HRT, you, your pellets will wear off or maybe they are already worn off um, and you'll find that there's a transition. If the pellet hasn't worn off yet, then honestly the transition is a little bit easier because it does take a little while, particularly with the patch of the cream to get drug levels. Um, and so it can take a week or two, sometimes even three before you're really getting a reasonable level of medication that's addressing your symptoms. So if you have pellets in now, um, it's kind of nice because as that drug level from the cream is, is coming up, the, the drug levels from the pellets going down and it's an easier transition. Um, but it's really just as simple as starting it um, and letting the pellet wear off and, and stop using the pellets. Um, you know, the cream doesn't hurt <laughs> or the pills or the patch. Um, and there isn't the risk of infection. I have had some patients come to me that have had bad infections from the pellets. Um, and so, you know, all these side effects, extra side effects from the pellet therapy, you don't have to worry about. Um, it's really an easier way to do it. It's basically, you know, similar medication. Um, it's just, again, a different way of getting into your body in a much less invasive way and kind of an easier, an easier way to do it. Okay, our next question is from Brenda. I have noticed that my ovaries ache at times. Is that normal? So this one always gives me pause. Um, it's normal to have pain sometimes in your pelvis. Um, whether that's from your ovary or not is hard to say. Um, and so women, this is an awful huge generalization, but I find that women often blame aches and pains in that area on their ovaries. And it may or may not be from the ovaries. Um, you know, there's sort of this thing, if you, if you look, when kids get stressed, they tend to get tummy aches. When men get stressed, they think they're having a heart attack. Uh, and when women get stressed, their ovaries hurt. So I'm not saying this is in your head. Um, it just always kind of, you know, you're having pain down there. Um, is that ovarian pain? Let's say that it is. So it is normal for women and men, but women in particular to get pain in their pelvis sometimes from time to time probably doesn't have anything to do with the medication we're using. Um, and it may or may not have anything to do with the ovaries. If the pain is severe and it's not going away, it's possible that you have a problem on your ovary. Maybe there's a cyst or a torsion or other ovarian problem that needs to be addressed. And that needs to be looked at with an ultrasound or, or um, you know, or other imaging modality or, or an exam at least. Um, but if it's just sort of, you get some aches and pains down in your region where your ovaries are from time to time, that's a pretty normal occurrence and probably nothing to worry about. Okay, Kate, I'm 49 and I've been taking HRT for five months. How long can I safely take it? What about the medication thickening the lining of the uterus? So um, you can safely take it as long as you need it. We sort of already talked about um, how long women are on HRT and, and how to discontinue it. At 49, my guess is you're gonna need it for a while, um, probably more than that average of five years, but maybe not. Um, but it'll be safe to stay on as long as you need it, as long as it's helping your symptoms. As far as the lining of the uterus, um, estrogen by itself, will thicken the lining of the uterus. And that's why we never prescribe estrogen alone in women that still have a uterus. We always combine it with progesterone. And that combination of estrogen and progesterone 
keeps the lining of the uterus from getting thickened. Um, thickened lining of the uterus is a dangerous problem. It can cause bleeding, but more importantly, it can cause changes in the lining of the uterus. Um, something called hyperplasia, which is a precancerous condition, or if completely ignored, could eventually lead to an over, I'm sorry, a uterine cancer. So that's why we never prescribe estrogen by itself in somebody that has a uterus. So if you're, you haven't had a hysterectomy, you still have a uterus, that estrogen is always combined with progesterone, and that progesterone is there to protect the lining of the uterus and keeping it from thickening. Um, so um, you should be safe. Okay. Next question is from Mary Lou. Isn't there a hair loss with BHRT? How is this curtailed if so? Sorry, say that again. Um, isn't there hair loss with BHRT, how is this curtailed if so? So usually not actually. Um, hormone replacement therapy, BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, but really any hormone replacement therapy, um, but again, we use bioidentical, usually increases the health of hair. Uh, it makes the hair thicker, more lustrous, more like younger hair, and it shouldn't cause um, hair loss. Overdosing the DHEA, so in like really large doses of DHEA, that can cause a male pattern balding um, because we overshoot the testosterone. But again, in 25 to 50 milligrams of DHEA, you really shouldn't see that. So HRT really should not cause hair loss. Um, it, it's really the opposite to make the hair thicker, um, you know, and more, more youthful. Okay. Angelica said, did you say that uterine cancer in the family makes you a candidate for HRT? My mom passed away from uterine cancer, but my OBGYN, who initially put me on HRT in 2019, said it was completely okay for me. I agree with your OBGYN. So a family history of uterine cancer is not a problem. A personal, if you've had uterine cancer, absolutely you should not be on HRT. But a family member with uterine cancer is not a reason that you should you can't have HRT. It's, it's fine for you to be on HRT with that family history. The exception, yeah. sorry. <laughs> there is this thing called the, the Lynch syndrome. There's a Lynch one and a Lynch two. This is rare thing, but it does occur. So if like all your family members are dropping dead of various cancers, particularly uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, it's possible that there's this genetic trait called the Lynch syndrome um, that you should be tested for if it's just one family member it's not that okay but if like everyone in your family seems it's like there's this curse on your family of female cancers probably should be genetic tested for that um because there is treatment for that um that's pretty rare but i, I like to say that just because i want to educate people just in case it's there that might save your life but if it's just one family member with uterine cancer um that's safe for you to be on nature So Mary Lou said, what does the treatment protocol look like if we get on Winona? Do we do telehealth appointments on a monthly basis? So the way it works is um, there's an onboarding process where we ask you a bunch of health questions and it's really um, focused health questions. Um, I didn't put a bunch of fluff in there. I basically designed this. So it's all the things that, that would I ask all the things that would keep me from prescribing HRT. And if you answer yes to those, then we say, I'm sorry, you're not a candidate for this. So if you sort of survive that, um, we ask your symptoms, we ask some other basic health questions. Um, and then I have an algorithm that suggests a uh, treatment protocol. Um, and again, I've talked about this before, but that algorithm works really well. And then you tell us, what do you prefer? Pills, patches, or cream? And we show you what that looks like. Um, and we offer that to you. So then you would say, yeah, I would like this. Um, and then it goes to me um, or one of the other doctors. And we look at your health question, just make sure we didn't miss anything and make sure that you really are an appropriate candidate for this. We sort of double check that the algorithm didn't mess up, although honestly, it doesn't. Um, but I always take it. I always double check. Um, so far, so good. And we've got, I don't know, over 6,000 patients um, under our belts um, with this algorithm. Uh, and then... Um, then we prescribe the hormone replacement therapy that you've already said, yeah, I'd like this if the doctor thinks this is a good choice. Comes, we get, you get an explanation um, that explains everything. Sometimes patients have questions and they're not ready to say, yes, I want this. And so then um, 
if you ask some questions, then before we prescribe anything, we'll answer your questions. There'll be a little back and forth until you feel comfortable and you tell us, yeah, I'm ready. Then we'll prescribe the medication. Uh, we have our own pharmacy um, that makes the medicines. If it's, it, it compounds the, the cream, if it's a cream, they package medication and they mail it to you. There's a little check-in that's basically, it's, it's, it's an Autobot that sends you an email that says, hey, we're checking up with you. And if everything's great, you don't need to respond, but if there's issues, um, let me know. And that's just to make sure you got your medicine okay. You've kind of had a few days, maybe a week under your belt. You understand how to use it. There aren't questions there. If everything's great, you don't hear from me again until you've been on the medicine about 10 weeks. So it's about 11 weeks um, from when you um, when, when you got the prescription or when, when I wrote the prescription. It takes about a week or so to get it started. So at that mark, then there's another questionnaire that you fill out that basically asks how you're doing, you know, it, are, is it relieving your symptoms? Are you having side effects? Do you want to keep going with this dose? Is this the right thing for you? And if you say yes, then um, we say, great. Um, and I supply a year's worth of refills and we do that every year. If you say no, then we look into it like, gee, what's wrong? Are you having side effects? Is it not working? Do we need to change the dose? And we adjust as needed. Anytime you can send a message to me with a question or a problem that you're having. It's like, oh gosh, you know, I'm having this bloating or my goodness, I got bleeding out of nowhere or I was reading online and I'm wondering about this. And so you're free to ask me questions anytime and I'll answer those usually within a couple of hours. Um, I try to answer questions within a few hours. If you ask it at two in the morning, it probably won't be answered uh, until I wake up, but occasionally I'll deliver a baby and I'll say, oh, there's a question to answer. Um, people are sometimes surprised by that. And so there, there's this possibility for as much give and take as you need for you to be comfortable with this, and, you know, and, and to get your questions answered. Um, and for some people, we really almost never communicate because it just works well and that's great. And other people have more questions and, and there's a lot of back and forth. So that's kind of how the process works. Um, it's really designed to be um, as easy as, uh, as possible for both of us, um, but as much help as you need, we're willing to spend that time with you and, and give you that help. So that's how the, the telehealth process works. Hey, Dr. Green works hard. He's always answering questions on the weekends and stuff. <laughs> I've had some patients yell at me. <laughs> yeah, they're like, stop working. working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Diamond had a question. So if you have HBP, you don't prescribe HRT. Say that again. So if you have HBP, you don't prescribe HRT. If you have high blood pressure. Okay. If you have controlled high blood pressure, HRT is safe. So let's say I, I was a woman. Okay. I have high blood pressure, but I'm on medication and my blood pressure is controlled. HRT would be safe for me. So if your blood pressure is totally out of control, um, then no, HRT is not a good idea. But if you're, if you're on medication, even if it's a couple of medications, but you've got that blood pressure under reasonable control, then yes, you can have HRT. It's, it's safe for you. So the, the first step is to get the blood pressure under control, then we can give you the HRT. Okay. We have April has her first order on the way. Kate's thinking about switching to Anona. Mia says, thanks, Dr. Green Live. This was amazing. So we don't have any more questions for you. Um, if there's any last minute questions while we have Dr. Green, throw, oh, Mary Lou, how much does it all cost? So you got to send us your arm and your leg. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we try to keep it as reasonable as possible. And it really depends on what mode that you use. So the cream tends to be the least expensive if you need both estrogen and progesterone, because we can mix it together. Um, the monthly cost for the cream, I believe, is $79 per month. If you order a three-month supply, you get a discount. It's about a 15% discount. It's $199 for the three months because um, we don't have to package it three times and mail it three times, so it saves us. So we, we pass that savings on to you. Um, the pills, if you need estrogen and progesterone, I think it works out to about $18 for three months more, so it's a little bit more and not huge. Patches are expensive. Um, they're about twice as much um, as the pills or the patches. I'm sorry, the pills or the cream. The DHEA is $24 for a three month supply. But you got to re remember that includes all the doctor visits. We don't charge you for shipping. That's your total cost. There's no hidden cost in there. Um, so um, you don't have to, you know, 
you don't have to go to the doctor's office and sit in the waiting room with all the people coughing and, and stuff and and then sit in the in the little room waiting for the doctor and spend your whole day in the doctor's office and you don't have to go to the pharmacy um, and get the medications so there's a big convenience factor um, plus um, the, the doc, you know basically unlimited doctor visits are included as much as you need to talk to me uh, we don't charge for that so um, that's basically the cost okay wait i opened the floodgates uh -oh. um victoria asked how do i get started i just sent you the onboarding victoria but put in here if you have any more questions on that um thank you so informative thank you uh victoria asked does the cream need to be refrigerated no um it's stable at room temperature fabulous april asked do any insurance companies cover winona meds by chance so we do take hsa fsa cards um so if you have a high deductible ppo and you have an hsa or if you have an fsa benefit with your company um we do take that we have had we don't bill insurance for you um but we have had patients successfully um, send in a claim. Um, so we'll give you the receipts and stuff you need to do that. Um, and we have had patients get reimbursed. The insurance is so crazy in the United States. There's so many different plans and so many different types um, that it's impossible to say whether your insurance is gonna cover it or not. Honestly, I think most don't, but we have had patients have success um, getting coverage. Okay. What are the bioidentical hormones derived from? So they're plant-based. Um, they're no soy. Um, they're um, mostly coming from yams. It was interesting because um, the, the supplier of the, the base hormones um, used to package that they were completely yam derived and they changed the wording on that. So we assume they're still mostly yam derived, but there may be some other derivative they're getting. Um, but we know um, they're, they're soy free, they're um, um, vegan, um, and basically plant-based plant and mostly from yam. Perfect. April Kaiser, you know, I just saw that. Kaiser doesn't, Kaiser doesn't play nice with others. No, yeah. I'm not a big fan of Kaiser, but there's historical reasons for that. Um, but yeah, Kaiser Kaiser doesn't, doesn't play nice with others. So Kaiser definitely won't cover that. April said, do you need to request a super bill? Do you provide those? So super bills are basically used in doctor's offices to, um, to hand to the biller to bill insurance. It's not something that people generally use to file a claim. Um, we give a receipt um, and we also give a, a medical necessity, a letter basically with a um, diagnosis code for the visit and that kind of thing um, that you would use for your insurance. Diamond said that you're so thorough. Thanks again for all the info. I appreciate it. April says, thank you so much. Awesome. Well, Dr. Green actually has like a doctor event he has to go to after this. So I'm going to let him go, but thank you guys all for your questions. We have webinars every month. So if you, we didn't answer your question or if you have another one, um, you can attend our next webinar. You'll also be getting this as a replay and I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Yeah. And I'm sorry about that technical problem in the middle there. That was embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, you left me alone out there. Especially since we're a tech company, basically. huh? <laughs> anyway, uh, ask me your questions online. Um, you know, through the portal, we're happy. And if I'm not your doctor, you have Dr. Davis or Dr. Bonato or, or Dr. Kat. Um, we're all happy to answer your questions. So don't be shy um, about messaging us if you have questions. Take Thank care, you everybody. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.